Uh, please welcome Adam Crone. Adam Crone is a distinguished architect at Synopsys, working with customers worldwide on complex DFT, ATBG, and security issues for digital ICs. He's part of the hardware analytics and test R&D group and has been with Synopsys for over 24 years. Uh, Syracuse University graduate, Adam also worked in test-related fields at Motorola and Texas Instruments for over 37 years in the industry. Adam is chair of the IEEE standard 1838, uh, which standardized 3D IC test access, and he's also the editor of the IEEE standard uh, T1149.4. He's also chaired the Test Technology Technical Council's Test Technology Standards Committee, which oversees the development of test standards and is an IEEE uh, Golden Core recipient. Uh, he has authored various papers and book chapters throughout the years and is frequently a uh, moderator, a panelist, invited speaker at various test or security focused conferences. So please welcome Adam. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks everyone for joining this uh, session today. Um, so I, Adam Cron works for, for Synopsys and as mentioned, I'm also the current chair of IEEE 1838, which um, has standardized access to chiplet 2.5D 3D IC packages um, for test purposes. Uh, so I'll catch us up hopefully today. I'm not, not speaking quite as long maybe, but uh, so as, as was mentioned, I've been with Synopsys for about hundred years. Uh, so I'll just dive right into a little bit of history. Um, and by, let's see. By history, um, I mean like yesterday kind of thing. Um, so let's just look at the die level first, uh, single die monolithic uh, uh, design, 100 million flip-flops. That would be, uh, I would qualify that as a, as a large design, not, not huge, but large. Um, so 100 million flip-flops in a regular single die implementation. Maybe you wanna create scan chains of a thousand flip-flops per chain. That gives you a hundred thousand scan chains. Let's say you have 32 scan channels uh, on your device. That leaves you with 3,125 scan chains per channel, which is pretty high. Uh, you can add compression. Let's say it's you know in the neighborhood of 200x. It's probably you know pretty aggressive, but not super aggressive. People have achieved that. So that gives you maybe 16 blocks to run. Um, still, you'd run those serially if you only had 32 in, 32 out, or if you have more scan channels like 512 scan channels, you can run them all at the same time maybe. And how long would that take? And let's say your cores are running at 50 megahertz shift rate and you had 10,000 patterns per block. Uh, you're gonna run anywhere between you know, 3.2 seconds and 0.2 seconds, depending on how many scan channels you do have. And again, this is high level uh, at the moment. Um, but if you're going for 512 scan channels, that's really 1,024 IOs that you're contacting at test, and that doesn't include power or clocks or anything else. So that, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, 15 gigabits of data, it's a, lot, it's a lot to ask, right? So what I'm going to do is exactly the same thing as the previous speaker did, <laughs> uh, but I'll do it better. Um, <laughs> So basically what's old is new again, right? Um, we're gonna leverage all the tools and toolbox we have, plus a couple of new things to get you over this hurdle uh, in a multi-die environment. But let's first start out at the, at the block level or at the, uh, the die level, if you will, um, with scan fabric. How do you get data in a bunch of wires at the top level and out a bunch of wires at the top level? Uh, to accomplish that, typically you need some clock that's synchronous with the tester to get data in and out. So the EDA tools, they put in a, an on-chip clock controller block for you and they intercept the high-speed PLL generator or whatever uh, uh, clock generator you have in the design and, and add a synchronous clock up top. And now you can shift synchronously. Um, in addition, this scan fabric is actually getting a little more complex these days, as was even mentioned earlier. Um, but we can uh, actually pipeline that scan data to keep the clock speeds up from one end of a die to another end of a die. We can even ratchet the clock up and down uh, and change our, our bandwidth, if you will, our, our number of wires uh, going from the top level, maybe a few wires at a high speed to the lower levels, uh, more wires at slower speed. And then we can pick off resources as needed. So there's some sophistication now in the scan fabrics uh, being created. 
And once you have that scan fabric, those components, you can glue them all together and create some kind of a, a topology to, to get data, as I mentioned, from let's say uh, some speed at the top uh, at the top level uh, to your cores, which I, again, I've, as an example, I was saying might shift to 50 megahertz or, or whatever the number is. Um, so these kinds of topologies could be created to get the data quickly from here to there. And again, this is whether it's uh, at the die level or at, at the multi-die level, which I'll, I'll talk about eventually later in this talk. So here comes your scan fabric and you drop in these little components to, to get the data from the top level down into the uh, little pieces of DFT you have scattered around uh, your design. And uh, as I mentioned, let's say we have 16 blocks and those blocks have compression in them. So what does compression look like? What is compression doing for you? Compression is taking some small number of scan in, streaming scan in wires and expanding them out to multiple shorter scan chains internally inside the core or the, the block that you're testing. And then pinches it back down again to a, you know, a smaller number, one or more uh, wires coming out of the uh, a core. On the output side, typically there's XORs to combine those scan out pins uh, and get them down to a reasonable number at the output side. Inputs might be multiplexers like we use in DFT Max, or they might be XORs like we use in our um, uh, XLBIST uh, kinds of uh, compression architectures. But it gets a little bit even stranger than that. They can do some, a lot of interesting things. For example, uh, DFT Max Ultra uses a, a shift register on the way in. So now we can pinch uh, a, a small number of wires down to an even smaller number of wires. Um, likewise, um, you might have a, some kind of a, an LFSR on the front end. So data could come in, a, a packet of data could come, be, come in and be used uh, for several shift operations, for example. Um, likewise, on the back end, uh, DFT Max Ultra uses on the left a streaming miser. So uh, data comes out through the XOR tree and comes into a register, which then gets uh, convolved with data in the register as it streams and drops out of the uh, scan path and onto the, the scan fabric. On the right-hand side, uh, there might be a miser kind of a function uh, where several patterns might be compressed uh, or several shift cycles could be compressed into a register. And at the end of each pattern, that register could be read. Or this infrastructure could be used, reused, uh, like for, for our Excel BIST uh, technology, so that uh, a packet of seeds could go in, several patterns could be run, different clocks could be used during those patterns to capture the results, and the miser could then compress that signature um, into the result. And these technologies also have uh, the compression technologies, the BIST technologies also have X blocking technology as well. So there's ways, various ways to block Xs from uh, corrupting data or causing you to have to create a mask uh, for that data on the way out uh, for analysis. So back to our chip or die, uh, logic BIST that could be hooked up to the scan fabric or we add 1149.1, uh, which is the ubiquitous serial access for control and test data. And on the left side would be four or five wires uh, coming into that particular die. On the right side is either a 1500 or 1687 or both kind of an interface, the same, same kind of difference, which go into a box called uh, some kind of a server or router function you can, you can consider that, um, uh, we call it, uh, I, I termed it a SIB server. Uh, it, it would have a collection of um, multiplexers and selection technology to enable access to certain little blocks that are hanging off of this um, boxes I'll show you. Or you can give access to, uh, let's say an APB bus so that a CPU could come in. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a security enclave or a, a FUSA uh, safety controller to drive uh, built-in self-test or other kinds of um, diagnostic accesses that uh, the device might wanna, might wanna make. So in addition, uh, speaking of FUSA, uh, functional safety, uh, you might give access then to a power on self-test functionality or in-system test functionality so that these 
Excel BIST or Logic BIST blocks can, uh, can do their thing at power on or power off or periodically in the system, depending on what kind of uh, safety is required for this or what kind of reliability uh, standards are you trying to meet. Uh, in addition, you might try the tie the logic BIST functionality into this serial excess scheme uh, so that, you know, again, it can run uh, power on self-test, et cetera, et cetera. Memory BIST like, likewise uh, could be tied in uh, so that the CPU could run memory BIST uh, in the field or uh, manufacturing test could kick off the memory BIST uh, through the 1149.1 interface, for example. In addition, other IPs might be hanging off of this uh, access infrastructure. Again, all uh, uh, seamlessly connected, if you will, to the, uh, to the infrastructure for test access. And these IPs might be your IPs, they might be our IPs. Um, Synopsys has the number one set of mixed signal IPs in the world. So chances are that you probably have some IP from uh, Synopsys uh, running on your system. There might also be other system lifecycle management uh, data that you want to collect uh, during functional use. Uh, for example, there might be um, uh, reliability monitors or temp sensors or IR drop monitoring functions. And you might use those in the system to do um, dynamic uh, voltage frequency scaling operations or to tune uh, exactly what the clock frequencies are doing at the time or to given different loads. And then you can do analysis on that either in the system, on that data in the system or in the cloud for various purposes. Um, maybe from a security standpoint, you wanna discover some anomalous behavior uh, of your fleet in the field, you could do that. You could collect, collect data and compare it die to die uh, and see if there's some outliers uh, in, the, in the field and figure out uh, what's going on with those. Uh, during... hey Adam, do you yes. do you have a, a current examples of this from other customers potentially that are actually using that kind of mechanism in the field today? Uh, yeah, we have um, actually later on uh, in this in these days, uh, Guy Cortez is going to present on on the data aspect mm -hmm. of this test and data road <laughs> we're talking about. Um, so he could probably better address uh, applications like that. Okay. Excellent. And in fact, in his talk, if you if you listen to his talk, he'll give examples of uh, using you know mass data to basically drill down and figure out that a particular device is having an issue. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. So, infrastructure-wise, there's lots of tools in the in the DFT quiver, if you will. Um, I've gotten way off course though, because we were talking about our 100 million flip flop. I don't know how I got so far off course there. Um, so let's go back to our 16 clump of blocks of IP that we need to test. We have lots of compression hanging off there. And I mentioned that if you don't have the IOs, you need um, to test those serially. That's just how it works out from a compression standpoint. Um, or you can gang them up. But as was mentioned before, high-speed interfaces are all the rage now. Um, in fact, you can use a USB or PCIe uh, controller, and you can either use the functional pathway uh, shown on the bottom here, or 1149.10 has a, its own kind of minimal controller that could be used to get access to more internal bandwidth compared to the external. And this ends up being actually a, a good power saving mechanism as well, you can imagine. Uh, just a few USB wires at uh, let's say 40 gigahertz uh, gets you a lot of data into the chip and then you can ratchet that down uh, and spread it out to multiple scan ins and scan out wires. Um, and everything else is all kind of transparent to the user, if you will, all the diagnostics works, all the core based uh, infrastructure works the same. So, Let's zoom in a little bit on this um, USB interface. Uh, we're talking about 15 gigabits of data. And if, again, if you don't need the mask, that's 10 gigabits, uh, five gig in, five gig out, whatever it is. Um, USB 4 gives you kind of a raw 40 gigabits of uh, bandwidth. So if you talk 40 gigabits on the, in, or 40 gig, gigahertz on the input side, 
uh, down to 50 megahertz at the core, you've got like a factor of 800 to play with. Um, so you can turn those two wires into, you know, many, many, many wires if you needed them internally. Um, but you can also break it down in sections. For example, maybe you could bring it in at two gigahertz for a while and then bust it down to 400 megahertz or whatever, whatever you needed. Um, and then pick off the bandwidth and resources that you need on a core by core basis um, or multiple core basis uh, if you're doing um, broadcast mode or something like that. And you can be able to see all the data that you need to and get it in and out of the chip at, at 40 gigahertz. Uh, now you're, you're back in business again. Um, power though, is gonna be a little bit of a story. Now I talked about power in another MEPTEC session so I'm not going to dive into the solutions there. I encourage you to look at that other MacPet section, session, which has a, a lot of solutions to both uh, shift power reduction and capture power reduction. So have a look there. Because um, it turns out, you know, your clock, for example, might be 50% of your power. So you need to control how much, uh, how much clocking is happening um, for every shift cycle. You don't want all those clocks lined up. But a solution there is when you go from 40 gigahertz down to 50 megahertz again, just for example, uh, you've got 800 cycles between. So you can pick off different phases for shift and lower your um, instantaneous, even though it's shift, uh, instantaneous uh, power usage on each edge of the clock by just dithering uh, the shift clock around. So you don't have them all lined up uh, at the exact same time in, in, uh, in the shift cycle. So, but this is a multi-core story. So let's go back to, to, the, to the real deal uh, about chiplets, et cetera. So now we're, 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 uh, we're chipleting or uh, 2.5D-ing or 3DIC-ing. Um, and there's now a pathway between this die that we've been talking about so far and other dies. So this might be uh, synchronous or asynchronous pathways from different functional parts of your design to other die. This also might be structured interface pathways like a bunch of wires or HBI, and I'll, I'll talk about HBI in a second. Um, but as the, the, the first speaker mentioned, you know, standards play a part here and the need for DFT in some of these uh, connectivity pathways to do interconnect tests is, is important. Um, the second speaker mentioned boundary scan, but obviously boundary scan isn't, is almost of no use here because we're we're not uh, really driving high high uh, high um, power signaling uh, die to die, and you don't want an extra boundary scan cell. So you're basically building up the interconnect test sometimes out of the wrapper cells of devices, or uh, in the case of HBI, some kind of structured uh, interface pathway. So HBI uh, has some redundancy in it. Uh, so I think this is like a uh, four gigahertz or something like that, uh, or gigabits per second kind of pathway um, with, with two bumps per channel of redundancy. And so uh, during manufacturing test or in the field, uh, the, tool, the tools can, uh, uh, HBI can basically check itself, train itself, uh, and then based on that redundancy, build a mask pattern, which could be, let's say, fuse programmable at, at power up, so that if there is a problem on one of these bumps, you can basically shift to other bumps um, using this kind of uh, DMUX MUX structure uh, to get the data successfully uh, from one die to the other across the, the HPI interface, for example. So these, these tools have, or these, uh, these IPs have some resources in them uh, to help you out uh, to fix problems like this. So, you have the structured and the unstructured uh, uh, interfaces uh, going to other die. So here we have HPI to HPI, here we have IPs, but how do you get data from the, uh, the bottom of the stack, if you will, up to those other die? Well, 1838 was mentioned earlier uh, as a solution. So 1838 solves um, the, the standardization problem that was mentioned earlier as well um, in the first talk about uh, getting data from one die to the other in a, in a standard way. Um, 1838 then can fan out the serial pathway, um, a la 1500, 1687 to control resources. And it also has the flexible parallel port, the optional um, higher bandwidth 
um, higher content uh, pathways to get data up and down the stack. So that solves a lot of the uh, access mechanisms um, from one die to the next. And then memory uh, is also something that needs to be tested. So uh, XRAM, you can see down here, um, could be used to talk through the PHY to do BIST on a stack of die if the die itself didn't have a uh, uh, memory BIST in, in and of itself, um, which many don't have uh, memory BIST to test the cells themselves. There might be some interconnect support, some slow speed interconnect support, some high speed interconnect support, but there's not a cell test. So an XRAM functionality might be useful to do the cell test of that stack of memory. And then diagnostics, uh, chiplet-based diagnostics is really leveraging what had already be done, been done at the uh, SOC stage. So even now with large SOCs, we do core-based diagnostics and core-based ATPG um, so that when you put your bunch of cores into a chiplet, if there's a failure, uh, the diagnostics is typically all the way down to the core level just because of the, the memory footprint for these large designs uh, and the time that you need to uh, spend getting the results. So if you can do it at the core level, it's a lot faster. But this just adds an, a level of hierarchy, if you will. Um, everything else is effectively the same. It's leveraging the same kind of hierarchical access that we've already developed for uh, uh, die-based or single die-based kinds of applications. So now we've kind of come, come full circle. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot of problems here. <laughs> Um, the solutions are already there from the single die. We've just leveraged 1838. Um, in our tool set, we add uh, that infrastructure at the RTL level. But frankly, this, the interfaces to the die could have been cut almost anywhere, right? And that's why I call it fungible DFT. Um, it's, it's simply, how do you want to divide up your function uh, into the little kind of pieces that you have uh, to, get, to get you where you want to go. So in conclusion, basically DFT, ATPG diagnostics uh, is available at the die and the stack level. And 1838 has basically kind of completed the infrastructure piece of how to get data from here to there. Um, as I mentioned, what you do with that data, uh, Guy is going to talk about uh, later in this uh, set of sessions um, in the three-day MEPTEC Road to Chiplets um, uh, panel. Um, DFT features, though, are really integral to mission mode even. For example, logic BIS could be used in safety application. Um, I mentioned HBI training for high-speed interfaces can be used in the field. Uh, memory BIS might be used for a, a reliability interrogations to figure out you know, how is your system doing in time. And I'll tell you, uh, silicon lifecycle management also has the same kind of property. Uh, you can leverage those sensors at manufacturing time. Um, to, to check power during test for, as an example. Um, but then from a, from a system standpoint, you leverage those things to improve uh, power for different uh, software loads or do some security safety analytics uh, in mission mode um, or to in time detect liability degradation um, in the device itself or making use of uh, field data to, to accomplish that. So I wanna thank you um, for this and uh, Hope you enjoyed the rest of the presentations. Uh, were there any questions? Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple questions here. One of them is, um, you know, the, your previous slide, you know, looked like a lot of real estate. You know, how many? What's sort of the gate count of that? And you know, yeah. So, so how do we pay for that? Yeah. Right. So not so much gate count. Uh, I would I would kind of term it uh, as we used to use uh, way back in the day. It's all value add. <laughs> um, you can't test. Mm without scan, you can't develop a test without scan or compression. Yeah. Um, and, and likewise, therefore you can't ship your product without it. So, you know, these are small, there's, not, there's nothing huge here, um, but mm. at the, by the same token, you can't do without it. Um, it's yeah. just a way of life now. It becomes a manufacturability issue. Yeah. 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 Well, what about, um, you know, Adam mentioned earlier, you know, at the top of the, uh, uh, the series here uh, about life cycle management, you know, as interfaces evolve over time, you know, what, what are, what are you guys doing on uh, to help manage backwards compatibility forwards back compatibility, uh, you know, as, as we potentially get chiplets from anywhere uh, to try to integrate it on a, on a substrate. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, standards are definitely playing a role 
um, you know, JEDEC standard for memory, um, HBI is you know, creating a standard. There's, there are standards for the interfaces. Um, there's always going to be something ad hoc, like, like these kinds of connections going up and down. But then again, scan has never been standardized, right? We just kind of uh, de facto decided that MUX scan or LSSD was the thing to do and everyone adopted that. So there wasn't an issue there. Um, likewise, standards are playing a role in uh, the front end infrastructure. So that's, that's important. But I mean, Synopsys has always leveraged IEEE standards because um, we kind of believe that, that what you're selling when you build this stuff is, is a function. You're not selling DFT, right? No one's, no one's advertising uh, 1838 in their, in their um, you know, vision CPUs, right? It's just not happening or GPUs. Um, that's not what they're advertising. They're advertising quality. Um, but if the DFT is easy to put in, you'll just do that. Um, you'll probably not try and be too, too creative uh, on the DFT side because it's, it's fairly well caught up with the, caught up with the industry needs. Um, but you want, what you want to do and be creative is with your functionality. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Yep. I want to thank our sponsors once again who made this event uh, possible and free of charge for everyone. So uh, thank you to the sponsors. And if you have an opportunity to thank them when you are in contact with them, it is greatly appreciated so that they will continue to sponsor events. Uh, walking through the sponsors, uh, first and foremost is our diamond sponsor, Omcor, with their uh, differentiators in technology, quality, and service. And in the Emerald sponsors, we have Adventist, um, with the highest rankings from VLSI Research and a synopsis a silicon to software. We'd also like to thank our Ruby sponsor, Tech Search International. And most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today. And I look forward to uh, having everybody back uh, tomorrow. So thank you and have a good rest of your day.